Good morning, everyone. Um, many thanks for this kind introduction. And um, well, everything Benes has said um, is actually what I'm going to talk about, although not with the same enthusiasm and the way he did it. And another thing I can say is I apologize for the fact that I give this presentation in English, although I'm here for two days and my German isn't as good as his. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> I also would like to thank the um, MacArthur Institute for having invited me to talk about what I think is a very important topic, um, how do we deal with multilingual repertoires of children in our educational systems. And as I say in the title, and I was very pleased with the fact that yesterday and I couldn't understand everything, but I, I think I, I understood most of it. Um, that the whole idea of that we are more and more heading towards a society where we discuss things in, an, in a very binary way, which means that it is bla black or white. And I would like to advocate during my talk that we have to move and go beyond the binary ways of discussion in education, in society at large, but specifically within the context of multilingualism and the acquisition of the language of schooling. And um, so that idea of moving beyond binaries is, in, 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 in my view, one of the most important endeavors for us as scholars, but also as professionals um, in education and outside um, education. So what I'd like to talk um, with you about in, in, in these 45 minutes is briefly address the issue of language and social inequality in education. And I will mainly refer to data we've collected in our Flemish education system. And I'm not familiar with the German education system, but what I learned from colleagues like Ingrid Gogolin and others is that also that relationship between multilingual repertoires of children on the one hand and the, 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 the need to learn the language of schooling is also here a very sensitive uh, topic. And often it is linked to that concept of uh, social inequality. And then I will try to provide some data that the monolingual views, the monolingual dispositions or beliefs of, of, of teachers and principals and, and many of us in, in our educational systems is strongly based on four assumptions. And then I will try to provide some ideas um, of which I think it's time for new recipes and then I'll um, have some conclusions. So. Definitely across Europe and especially in our Flemish education system, social inequality and unequal outcomes in our education systems is and are or are a tenacious uh, problem. Luckily, we are faced by PISA every three years with that mechanism of um, inequality. And also, what we see in our educational systems, and I just heard that in some areas in Germany, um, we, we, you observe the same mechanisms of increasing segregation, both in the neighborhoods where people live, which has an impact on uh, an increasing segregation in our educational systems. What we also see on the basis of the PISA data, and I'll come back to that in more detail later in my talk, is that the language people use at home, where Ben Aissa has been talking about, is seen as the cause of this inequality. And I want to problematize the word cause within this context. Language use at home is by many of us seen as the cause of the inequality, the social inequality, and the inequality in our education systems. So speaking the home language is seen by many of us as hindering children's development. And my question is, is that rightly so? Is that assumption a correct assumption? Now, as a consequence of the fact that we read a correlation, that we read a correlation between children's background and their language use on the one hand and their performance on, let's say, PISA uh, tests, as a consequence of that causal reading in Flanders for the last 10, 15 years, and I think in many European uh, contexts or, or, or countries, uh, we see the same policies. To overcome this problem, language has become more and more pivotal, which is fine, which is great, and I think we have to address the issue of language and language acquisition. But 
I think, in the, in the political and the policy discourse, which impacts what we do in our educational systems, what we do in our classroom practices, it, is, it has become more and more a condition for school success. Now, once language becomes a condition for school success, it means that you look at it from a deficiency perspective and that you say, look, before you can participate in our educational systems, first learn the language and then you can participate. And I think this is, there lies a danger, but I'll come back to that. This conditionality is in Flanders very prominent in the, polit in the policy discourses and in educational practices. In most of our Flemish schools, we have an exclusive focus on what I call an L2 submersion model, where there is no space for children's language backgrounds. The L2 policies and the, and the L2 practices are often prior entering main, mainstream classrooms. And as we heard from the keynote yesterday, there are some concerns of having children in separate newcomers' classrooms for a too long period. We've done, two, uh, last year, we've done an analysis of an evaluation study of a similar policy we have for newcomers where children in secondary education have to stay for one school year in a separate classroom. We had the same outcomes as the outcomes being presented in the keynote yesterday. Even teachers in the newcomers' classrooms who feel like islands in the school, no processes or hardly any processes of integration. Sometimes, and here I have to be cautious because I'm not familiar with the context here in Germany, but definitely in Flanders, sometimes there is a ban and a suppress of the use of pupils' um, other language repertoires in school and in the classroom, and I'll come back to that. Now my question is, to what extent these views are superseded? On the one hand, international research seems to indicate that an exclusive L2 submersion model, the model we have in Flanders for the last 10, 15 years, since the first PISA data in 2000, seems to be less effective than assumed. Because what we see on the PISA data, when I compare the Flemish PISA data between 2000 and 2015, that actually the inequality gap increased and not decreased. One would suppose that on the basis of such a very explicit L2 submersion, exclusive L2 submersion model, that the inequality gap would decrease. We see the opposite. We also know from social linguistic research that unraveled the complex, and dyna the complex dynamics of youngsters' multilingual practices to communicate, to construct, and to share knowledge. Or, as Ophelia Garcia in her 2009 article says, we more and more translanguage, which is often something we do. But the difference is, and I'll come back to that in a minute as well when I talk about multilingualism as a double standard, when we translanguage, it is seen as fantastic. When they translanguage, it is seen as a deficit. Also from sociology research, we've learned that there are a multitude of explaining and intervening variables to explain mechanisms of social inequality. Interesting research being done which shows that when there is a, a culture within a school, what we called in our studies a teachability culture, the idea that not an individual teacher but a culture amongst teachers, well, whatever you do with these kids, it won't work. If that culture is present in a school, we've seen that that negatively impacts on pupils. And it leads, and we've been able to show that in a PhD, a PhD student who recently um, did his PhD on, on, on this topic, which leads to what we call a futility culture, a culture amongst, not an individual thing, but a culture amongst pupils. Well, we can try whatever we want. We'll never be successful. These negative dynamics between whatever you do, whatever we do, are devastating for children's um, success. We also see, and that's a very specific problem in Flanders, an, an, an extreme tracking system after primary education into the different tracks in secondary education. But also from educational research, we, there is a lot of evidence that there are other variables which explain mechanisms of social inequality, other variables than just language. Leadership, 
Yesterday, in the discussion, it was about teams. It was about the importance of strong leadership, which determines the example of the, the school. Um, uh, the, the school yesterday was a clear example of strong leadership and a strong team. And that we know from educational research that that impacts children's outcomes. Also, strong parent school networks are also, what we know from research, important variables to explain uh, mechanisms of inequality. And what we also know from SLA research is that an exclusive conditional L2 submersion model, a conditional model, where you keep kids out of the mainstream classroom is in contradiction of most of what we know of second language acquisition. Although all those who are um, familiar with the theories on SLA know that language learning takes place in the context where we use that repertoire. If we say to children, prior of participating in that repertoire where we exploit and use the language of schooling to unravel knowledge, first you will have to learn the grammar and the vocab, and then you can participate, is in contradiction of most of what we know um, of um, SLA. And, and also that uh, I'll come back uh, to in, in a minute, is we must be aware of the negative impact of monolingual perceptions and beliefs, and this is also um, recently documented in some of our work. As I said, we tend to treat multilingualism as a kind of double standard. On the one hand, multilingualism is promoted as an asset in Europe. It's fantastic. Um, people, yesterday people asked me, do you speak German? No, I don't speak German. I can read it and, and, and I understand a bit if you don't speak too fast. But um, the, the fact that we speak many languages, the fact, I always say, I, although I, I, I'm, I'm modest about my German, I'm always proud about my Italian and, my, and about my Spanish. And people say, oh, you speak Italian, you speak Spanish. And, and I said, look, the only Spanish I speak is to order tapas when I'm in Barcelona. But that's all I need. And the only Italian I know is to order a Prosecco in Perugia. But I mean, for for the time, for the time being, that's that's fine. That's why I, that's why I need languages for. So, but multilingualism is promoted to seen as an asset. And at the same time, when we look at migrant children's multilingual um, repertoires, then it is seen as a handicap, as a disadvantage, as a deficit, as having even teachers saying they have no language. At school. There's often, specifically in, in a Flemish context, there's space for the standard variety of the dominant language, is, which is the main repertoire which is uh, being allowed to be used. On the one hand, from psycholinguistic research, we know that foreign language learning contributes to the cognitive development. There is an enormous amount of, of interesting research, and a nice example is Paul Lesemann's work in, in the University of Utrecht, which shows what the cognitive advantages are of multilingualism. We all advocate, we all find it important. Look at Ellen Bialystok's um, research where she, where she shows that um, even in, um, in, with people having Alzheimer, that those who are bilingual, raised bilingually, their, their, their dementia comes, let's say, three to five years later. So we all know that, and yet when it's about migrants' home languages, then it is seen as an obstacle for cognitive development. Very interesting contradictions. So these are based on four assumptions. Migrant children only or mainly speak their home language at home and outside kindergarten. This is a deeply rooted belief amongst many teachers and principals in Flemish schools. Second, language spoken at home is the main explaining variable for children's cognitive development and school success. Three, knowledge of the dominant language is a condition for success. And four, allowing children to use their home language in childcare centers uh, and at school impacts their negative L2 learning and hence their development and school success. And I will deconstruct each of these assumptions very briefly. The first assumption, migrant children only speak or mainly speak their home language at home and outside kindergarten. We know that there is no empirical evidence for that. There isn't. All the empirical evidence, all the research shows that most people in an immigrant context at home translanguage all the time, depending on topic, context, time, with whom they speak. We talk with mother about school in Dutch. We talk with father about the holidays in Berber 
or Turkish or Polish. We, we switch all the time. Even, intra, even intrasentential sentential switches depending on the change of the topic. It is much more multi-layered, dynamic, and complex than assumed. This is an example, and you know all these kinds of examples. This is what we did with more than 100 migrant children in primary schools where we asked them to to write down their language passport. And here in the middle you see, or you don't see, the name of the child. And there the child, there the child indicates it speaks Turkish, it speaks French, Dutch, and Arabic. Interesting to see is what you have here in brown. Why, for, for, for what do you speak Turkish? To share secrets, to talk about animals when I'm angry, to do maths to think, why do you, for what reasons do you use Dutch to do maths, to share secrets, dreaming, talking about animals? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? When we look at the amount of Dutch being used with different interaction partners, then we see that he, their language use, their use of Dutch is more prominent in the home context than we, than, than, than we assume. Um, for instance, um, here I have to read. Oh, um, for instance, six friends outside of school. The assumption is once they leave the school gate, they don't speak any Dutch, they don't speak Dutch anymore. They shift to their mother tongue. Now, if you see, the larger the circle is, the more the pupils said they use Dutch. Now here, six is with children, with, with peers outside the school context. More than we assume they speak, um, they, sp they speak Dutch. Now what is interesting, we all know that, but when we show these and the previous examples, when we did that exercise with the teachers, it not only was interesting to gather, to gather research data, but it was mainly interesting to work with teachers and to work, and to, to work on, their, um, uh, on, on their language beliefs. Okay, the second assumption. The language spoken at home is the main explaining variable. Now, as I already said, most research shows no significant correlation for language spoken at home when controlled for other variables. In a bivariate analysis, then you see often a significant correlation between home language on the one hand and cognitive outcomes on the other. But once you start in multivariate analysis to control for other variables, then you see that often that correlation disappears. It strongly depends on how you operationalize, how you measure home language. What we see is on the PISA data, most of the time on the PISA data, home language is operationalized or measured in a dichotomous way. You speak that you, you speak your mother tongue, or you speak uh, you, you speak the, the dominant language, or you speak another language. Only in 2012, PISA used a non-dichotomous. They 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 measured a home language in a non-dichotomous way. They measured it on a scale. That was the only year that on the PISA data no correlation was found between language spoken at home and cognitive outcomes. So it is important to reflect on when we collect data how we measure the concept of home language. Now, we were interested to see to what extent using your mother tongue on the playground has any impact on cognitive outcomes. This is a study we did in, with a representative group of, of pupils in primary schools in Flanders. The assumption is, and in many schools, almost all schools in Flanders have in their school regulation something which stipulates um, no other language than Dutch is allowed to be used at school. Most schools in Flanders do have that regulation. Some children are punished for the fact that they speak, uh, when they speak their mother tongue or their home language on the playground. The assumption is, teachers and schools and principals do it with the best of their intentions. It's not because they want to discriminate. They do it on the basis of the belief that if on the playground they only speak Dutch, that'll have an, a positive impact on their learning and on their learning of Dutch. If we allow them to speak their mother tongue, that'll have a negative impact. Now, what was interesting to see is that 
The dependent variable here was reading comprehension, and we did the same for a non-language uh, independent variable being world sciences. Here, we have children who say, who indicate to speak always another language than Dutch on the playground. Here we have children who say that they always speak Dutch at the playground. We don't see a significant difference. And what, what, would have, what would we have expected? Language acquisition or an increase in language learning on the basis of 10 or 15 minutes is a bit naive to think that that will have an, an extreme impact on children's cognitive outcomes. But what is the most important thing is that all these deeply rooted or, or all these practices are based on monolingual beliefs. And these monolingual beliefs, as such, are not that problematic. But I'll, try, I'll show you data what the impact of these monobeliefs mono belie are. This is a banner at one of our schools in Flanders. And I'm sure you can read that. It is in the interest of your child that we speak Dutch here. What about you? Schools do it with the best of their intentions. The assumption that that will have a positive impact on their, on their learning. Now, we were interested in teachers' beliefs, in their dispositions. Now, here we, f we found some interesting data. These are data gathered with, um, uh, with a representative group of teachers in secondary education. And um, we gave them eight different assertions. And they had to score on a one to five point scale. Now, what is interesting to see is if you, um, I'm, I'm, we don't have time to go into all the eight assertions, but I'll show you just some. Non-Dutch speaking pupils should not be allowed to speak their home language. Eight on 10 agree. Eight on 10. The third one is also an interesting. The school library should also include books in the different home language of the pupils, less than 13%. A secondary school who has a school library has books in Dutch, in Flanders, has books in Dutch, in French, in English, and for me, in Italian and in Spanish, but definitely not in Arabic or Turkish. And the last one is also an interesting one. It is in the interest of the pupils that they are punished for speaking their home language at school. Three on 10. Three on 10 agree. We have video data, video recorded data, where children have been interviewed by our researchers asking, do you now and then speak your, 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 your uh, Turkish on the playground? Yes. Are you allowed to? No. What happens is if the teacher hears you speaking uh, Turkish, then we are punished. What do you have to do as a punishment? Oh. And the researcher asks, do, 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 do you have to write something? Yes, yes. What do you have to write? Do, do you have to write an, an, a short narrative or, or something, a one-page narrative? And the child answers, no. Most of the teachers say that, I have to, that we have to write 100 times, that, 100 times that I have been impolite. Recognition? I mean, just the idea that your language, and I'm not talking about identity because... Identity is a flawed concept. But just the idea that your language is being equalized with being impolite. Now, we weren't surprised with these data. We weren't surprised at all. But that was interesting. We asked the same teachers to score on a trust scale. It was an international scale, Chan and Moran scale, on, on trust. Do you have trust in these children? Do you think they will be successful? The horizontal scale are the score. These dots, that, that's the interesting thing about research. One can reduce teachers to dots. That's very impolite. I, I, I apologize for the teachers in the room. I really apologize. The horizontal axis is the, the, the monolingual disposition. So five scores are teachers have real strong monolingual beliefs or dispositions. Here you have teachers with more multilingual beliefs. The vertical, the vertical axis is the scores of the same teachers on the trust scale. With one low trust in your pupils, five high trust. And what you see is that there is a negative correlation between your language dispositions as a teacher and the trust you have in your pupils. I'm not interpreting this causal, but it is a correlation. And the correlation has some potential dangers. Because these are 
implicit, unconscious mechanisms. And we know that if I have low trust in my pupils, that that has an impact in my pupils' expectations. And that, when I have low expectations, that that impacts the practices in the classrooms. A couple of years ago, I had a PhD student who did a study, and amongst m many other um, uh, research data she gathered, she also ticked the na uh, after in the names of each of the child the, the, the frequency of participation in the interaction initiated by the teacher. And she had data of 100 minutes of video. In some of the, of the classrooms, some of the children were active more than 100 times in these 100 minutes. Some children nil. The teacher, when you ask the teacher, they love these kids the same way. There's no, in, in any way, a mechanism of explicit discrimination. These are implicit mechanisms. We give more open questions to middle-class children, and we give more closed questions to children from ethnic backgrounds. Explicit? No. Implicit. But these are the mechanisms of, to some extent, the way we look at languages, the way we look at children. Third assumption, knowledge of the dominant, <clears throat> knowledge of the dominant language is a condition for school success. We know that early acquisition of L2 is necessary for children's development and school success. That's absolutely true. And I strongly support the idea in many European countries, and I suppose it's also the case in, in, in Germany, and it's definitely the case, that our policymakers encourage immigrant families to send their children to school as early as possible. Early participation is important. However, I have the impression that we focus too much only on frequency of participation and not on quality. Frequency is important, but at the same time we have to be aware of the quality of, the, of uh, early childhood participation. What we see in our Flemish data is that there is indeed a positive effect of early kindergarten participation, but the effect under the age of four is very limited. Quality of the interaction, quality of classroom interaction is far more important. Last year, we done, we've done a study where we collected more than a thousand hours of video data in first year of kindergarten. And first year of kindergarten in Flanders is the age of two and a half. So the transition from childcare centers into first year of primary. And we collected all the interaction data in the classroom, video on, all day collecting, and then we analyze the data. For some children, for some children, the amount of language production, and we know that language production is key in processes of language learning, the amount of language production was no more, on a whole school day, was no more than seconds. Seconds. Again, we can't blame the teacher for that. Teachers often have large classrooms, it's very difficult, but at the same time, we see that if we do not support teachers, and here I fully agree what has been said yesterday, a strong cooperation between us as scholars and the professionals in education, and it's not a question that we have to translate our findings to the teachers. No, it also has to be the other way around. We need to go into a model of research of more bottom-up, active, and action research, where we take teachers and principals and schools as active partners, as agents, as active agents in the processes of research. And then I'm convinced that that will have a more positive impact. Also, 
Research indicates that high literacy in home languages strongly correlates with L2 literacy development. This is what Jim Cummins already said for many, many years. And this is of, this is, um, these are data on the basis of um, a study we did in Flanders in pre-primary and in primary education. Here the dots are children, and the horizontal axis are the scores of these children on a Turkish test, and these are the scores of these children on a Dutch test. And what you see is that there is, that there is a strong correlation between speaking uh, your proficiency in your home language and your proficiency of Dutch. And again, don't interpret it causally. It's not because of the fact that you're good in Turkish that you will be good in Dutch. No, it's also the other, the other way around. It's a much more dynamic mechanism. Fourth assumption. Allowing children to use their home language in childcare centers and at school impacts negatively their L2 learning and hence their cognitive development and school success. Here as well, there's hardly any empirical evidence for such an L2 submersion model, as I said from the beginning. Most in, most, in most schools, we see that L2 submersion policies not acknowledge and ban children's multilingualism. And there is no empirical evidence that allowing children to use their home language has that negative impact. We've done a study, and these are data from a very small scale study, um, but we've repeated that study with over s about 65 schools in, in primary schools in Flanders, but th these are the data of the first study where we, uh, where we saw and where we looked at children's reading comprehension after a longitudinal intervention and working with teachers. So what, were we, what did we do? It was the municipality of the city of Ghent, so the alderman of education who said, look, we want you to do a four-year study where you very actively working together with uh, teacher trainers, where you very intensively coach and work with the teachers and exploit and use and train the teachers and support the teachers and work with the teachers in not only acknowledging the languages of the children, but also exploiting and using their languages in the classroom. So it was not just we coming and collecting data and see what kind of outcomes we have, but really an intervention study where we intensively worked with the teachers. And we had some experiment schools and we had control schools. In the experiment schools, the teachers were intensively trained during the four years and um, uh, in the control schools, nothing was done. And in some of the control schools, there were these banners. By the way, there was one, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, there was one school, uh, one of the four experiment schools where there was also that banner as the one I, I showed you. Now what we see is that The average comprehension of Dutch of the children in the experiment school, which was called the A condition, and in the control school, we didn't see any difference in their, um, uh, in, in their comprehension uh, of Dutch. So exploiting children's repertoires seems to have no negative effect on children's reading comprehension. And that's what we saw the slide, the other slide I showed you. We even saw that late in, at, at a later age with children in, in, in primary. Now what was interesting here, after these four years and we showed this slide and we said to the Alderman of Education that it, that, that it didn't have any negative effects, the, the Alderman of Education was extremely disappointed. And, and I can understand him. Because he, his assumption was, we invest four years of money in an experiment, and we suppose that exploiting these multilingual repertoires, that that will have a positive impact on their L2 learning. And then we had to change the frame. And in our negotiation to the alderman, we said, look, in order to have positive impacts, we need more than just four years. Often that kind of impact comes after 16, 20 years. One can't suppose that because of the fact that you allow children to use their languages in the classroom, that that out of a sudden will have an enormous impact on their L2 learning. But what we do know, and that was for us very important, that it impacts what I call intervening variables. Because we know 
And we saw that exploiting the, the multilingual repertoires has a had a positive impact on children's self-confidence. And we also had data that it had a positive impact on children's well-being. Now, and some policymakers say, yeah, but it's about the hard data. It's not about self-confidence, and it's not about children's well-being. That's fine. But we want to find evidence on their cognitive outcomes. And my argument always is, if you do not pro try to have impact and show impact on these intervening variables, if you can't change these intervening variables, you will never be able to find strong outcomes at the cognitive at the end of the line. That's because we know that when a child is highly confident, when a child has a high self-esteem, when a child feels well at school, when a child feels motivated, when a child feels encouraged, when a child feels involved at school, we know that that impacts, his can impact his or her cognitive outcomes. So it is very important, not just because it's nice that it has a positive impact on children's self-confidence or, or on their well-being. It is an extremely important intervening variable where we have to look at. And maybe the most important thing of the study we did was that it impacts, it had major impact on teachers. The principal of one of the four schools where there was the banner at the school gate after one school year said, We, we need to get rid of that banner. And we asked in interviews why. And she said, my teachers have changed. I hear them speaking more positively about the children. I see less conflicts on the playground due to the fact that we have a very explicit, not a laissez-faire, but a very explicit multilingual policy. So I think for us that was the most important finding, that when you do such an intervention study, that it impacts not just children, but it also impacts teachers' dispositions. And as I told you, it is important to impact these dispositions and these beliefs. And this reminds me of what has been said, and that was one of the questions which was on Philip. We need to change the structures. And I agree, yes, definitely. But the most important structures we need to change are our mental structures. We don't do these things explicitly, but our beliefs has an, have an enormous impact on what happens in the classroom. So I think, or I, my question here is, do we need new recipes, given the fact that societies have changed, given the fact that we hardly can find any school which isn't diverse by definition. So the question is, which language education model should we strive for? And what we see in Flanders is that there, is, that there are two competing paradigms. Two competing paradigms for L2 learning, for learning to reduce the achievement gap. And in these two paradigms, there is an enormous, as I said in the beginning, an, an enormous binary way of thinking of, in, with regard to language education, in which one side is seen as the, the legitimate, the non-negotiable, and the other paradigm is seen as the deviant one. And the dominant paradigm is the L2 submersion model, where, there's, where there is no space for children's multilingualism or multilingual repertoires to being used and exploited. And I don't mean just allow them to use them on the playground, but an explicit policy where you exploit their language repertoires as part of their learning processes. And the other paradigm is the customary or traditional bilingual or multilingual education model. Now my question here is, should we adhere or should we go for the L2 submersion model or on the basis of a lot of empirical um, uh, research done by many scholars amongst us, people like Collier, people like Cummins and others, who've been sh who showed the power of bilingual education models, should we go for one of these two models? Now, before I answer that question, first, 
I like to have a very brief critical look at the traditional or the customary bilingual models. And as I said, we know that bilingualism has positive impact on metalinguistic awareness, on executive functioning, on cognitive flexibility, on information processing, etc. However, these traditional bilingual education models in the current contexts have their limits because it's very much a separation model, both spatially and temporally, in the sense that we have separate homogeneous classes where the Turkish children are in one class, the Moroccan children in another class, the Polish children in another class, and then you have the German children in yet another class. Temporary, separate lessons, separate moments of dealing with these languages, segregated groups of learners. This is in contradiction with what I said in the beginning, the fact that these kids translanguage all the time. And such a traditional model of bilingual and multilingual education currently has its limits in the sense that it has its educational challenges. In some Flemish schools, we have up to 50, 60 different languages in the school. There is an enormous need of bilingual teachers. I can't convince our Flemish Minister of Education to invest in 60 teachers of these 60 languages in each of our secondary schools. But also, what we saw in the traditional bilingual models was that there is low involvement of main mainstream teachers overall, and there, is, was, and there was low or no involvement of parents. So given the social context, as I said, the, the fact that we have super diverse spaces, both in schools and classrooms, giving the practicalities, the feasibility of customary bilingual education in urban heterogeneous classrooms, and given the theoretical, the increasing theoretical insights that new linguistic uh, conceptions of multilingual communication in today's complex worlds, as I said, the idea of the concept of translanguaging, and mainly given the counterproductive and highly ideologized binary discussion in society at large and education in particular, I think we need to move beyond the binaries towards a new approach to learning at school that integrates the multilingual repertoires of the children and L2 learning. And that's what we advocated for in our studies in Flanders, which we called functional multilingual learning. The fact that you exploit the children's repertoires, not just allowing to use the languages. When teachers or principals come to me, do you think we need to allow the language? And always say no, because then you, you, you do not take into account the concerns of the teachers. You have to go into a more explicit functional approach of exploiting the multilingual repertoires. So we called it exploiting the multilingual repertoires as a kind of didactical capital for learning. The functional use of the home languages in multilingual L2 dominant learning environments. So exploiting the multilingual repertoires of the children, not just, again, not just allowing, but actively, proactively exploiting them to raise multilingual awareness, to create positive language attitudes, to contribute to identity and status, to well-being, self-confidence, self-esteem, to express ideas, to express opinions and feelings, and in the long run, to contribute to learning. And this is, people always ask, okay, can you give me an example? And these examples are extremely trivial. And people say, oh, that's it, no more than that. Yes, but you have to reflect on the fact that just do it, and often we see a lot of missed opportunities. You two, both of Turkish background, you speak the same language, we are in a maths class, we are doing maths activities. I see in your eyes that you have problems with the maths activity, and I know that you are very good in maths, and I proactively say, help her. You can help her, and you can do it in Turkish. And here comes the concern of the teachers. Here comes the concern. Yeah, but I don't speak all these languages. What, 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 what are they talking about? Maybe they are gossiping about me. <laughs> Maybe you explained it not in the right way. And these two minutes that I, that I allow you to speak in Turkish are two minutes missed to learn Dutch. And I say, let's change a negative frame into a positive frame. See it as an advantage that you as a teacher don't speak all these languages. First of all, if they gossip, happy you that you haven't understood them. <laughs>
And by the way, we all gossip, don't we? The more, when you invite them to paraphrase what they've been talking about in Turkish, the more they say, uh, 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 the more likely it is that they haven't been talking about the task. And that you can play your role as a teacher, as a mediator in the learning process. Look, guys, I give you the opportunity to talk about the task, to use your language, but I have the impression that you've been doing other things. When you explain me what you've been talking about and you paraphrase in Dutch what you've been talking about in Turkish, and I see that at a certain point, point your, what you explain to your peer is incorrect, again, I can intervene and play my role as a mediator in the learning process. And I can say, okay, just up to that point, that was correct, but from that, that's a bit different. What we call powerful learning environments, powerful learning. And the fact that I challenge you to what you've been talking about in Turkish for two minutes, to paraphrase it in Dutch, is powerful for language learning. Very trivial, very simple. But we see so many missed opportunities. At the end of the intervention study, I showed you some data on. There was one teacher in first year of primary who said, now I realize that before the experiment, I was wandering around in the classroom as a kind of a policewoman. Children were working in groups. And I, all the time I said, what do I hear, Turkish? Only Dutch, I said. Now I realize that the impact of that is that the interaction stopped. And what, what is important for learning and for language learning? Interaction. So what I advocate for is a multilingual social interaction model for learning as an alternative for traditional language learning models. And this is just brief because my time is over. Just brief, what did we learn from these functional multilingual learning experiments we've done since 2008 in our Flemish schools? We saw no negative effects on learning of the language of schooling. We saw no negative effects on learning in general. We saw positive effects on children's self-confidence and their well-being. And we saw, and again, that's for me the most important thing, positive effects on their beliefs and their practice, the teachers' beliefs and their practices. We also saw that in a context of a multilingual policy, all children feel better at home. Interestingly, we saw positive effects on mixed group friendship relationships. And in the, other, in, in the longitudinal larger study, also positive effect on teacher perceptions. Now, what was the most interesting? Contrary to the fear of the teachers who said, yeah, what, when, 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 when we do experiments where we allow them to use them, their, their languages, they will no longer speak Dutch. Now, we did one experiment, and the experiment was that the children were taken out of the classroom context. Our researcher did an activity and said, homogeneous language groups, four, five, six children, and the researcher said, you can do this activity and no, rule, no rules here, you can do that in Turkish or in Polish, whatever language. The most surprising thing, the most surprising finding, finding of the research was that 68% of the interaction was in Dutch. 21 of the 32 left, which was in Turkish, in the L1, um, uh, 30, uh, uh, 32 was in, 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 in the L1, and 63% was on task, so which is 21% about the content, 42% on management, uh, managing the, the task, and 27 was off task, let's say gossiping. So that gossiping issue is not that problematic. In an open policy, teachers are more aware of the interactional dynamics of pupils and are thus more open to create powerful learning environments in which they allow the functional use of pupils, L1. And in schools with a strict monolingual policy or a vague policy, one can observe teachers and principals struggling with the multilingual realities and the strict rules. That's why it is important that it's not just banning or just allowing, but it is to find a very explicit policy. To conclude, for those during my talk think that I'm 
only in favor of multilingualism and multilingual education, and I have something against the importance of the language of schooling, this is the first important sentence for me to conclude. The L2, children's L2, is extremely important to function in society and in education. However, we have to reflect on the most meaningful pathway to it. Social inclusion and educational success can't be realized only through integration, short integration programs or L2 crash courses. We know that the impact of these short crash, crash courses, except for Ben Issa, that these, that these have an enormous impact. It is a continuous, complex, dynamic process. My colleague in Tel Aviv, Ilana Shohami, clearly showed, and there are other studies, but in her data, she's been able to show that Ethiopian children, children coming from low social backgrounds with parents who were illiterate and have low, or, or have low literary skills, it takes, on average, between nine and 12 years. Language learning is a continuous process. You can't say that it has to be a condition prior to mainstream classroom participation. It is in the mainstream classroom that the language is acquired. So we must reflect on how inclusion can be achieved whereby all languages are acknowledged, allowed to be used in the social space, and where permanent linguistic enclaves can be avoided, the idea of segregation. It is in the processes of language of social participation giving opportunities instead of discriminating on the labor market, in the schools, on the housing market. It is in the process of providing opportunities to participate in society and in building social networks that languages are being acquired. True language use. So I advocate for a policy in which the linguistic repertoires of each person are being used as a strength for learning and social participation. For those of whom who wants to study Dutch, these are just some sites where we have tools and materials and training tools and video examples of uh, all the studies we did. And I know you all know this, this quote of Jim Cummins, but nevertheless, when I talk about this topic of multilingualism, I always want to end with this quote because it's such a powerful quote, something he wrote in 2001. And I'd like to read it for those who don't know this quote. To reject the child language in the school is to reject the child. When the message, implicit or explicit, communicated to children in the school is leave your language and culture at the schoolhouse door, children also leave a central part of who they are, their identities at the schoolhouse door. When they feel this rejection, they are much less likely to participate actively and confidently in classroom instructions. Thank you very much.